Hey everybody, welcome back to Carpool Chats. I'm John Eichberger, the Executive Director of the Fuelers Institute. And today we're with Cam Okafor with Trillium. And we're going to talk about what we're doing in the market to help decarbonize the heavy and medium duty transportation space. Kim, thank you so much for joining us on Carpool Chats again. Of course, I'm happy to be here. And can you tell us a little bit about what Trillium is? Not everybody in the audience is going to be familiar with the company. Definitely, definitely. I, I'm going to start by talking about our parent company, Loves Truck Stops and Travel Stops. So we're Loves, much more familiar with that name, aren't we? <laughs> definitely. So, so everyone's familiar with Loves. We have almost 600 truck stops across the country. We build somewhere between 40 and 50 truck stops a year, which kind of pans out to a truck stop a week um, across the country. Our focus, um, our target market is the Class Seven to Eight uh, truck. Over the road trucking um, that keeps the backbone of our of our country up and running every day. So so we're excited to do that. Um, our we are a fueling company, so we don't focus or we don't push any one fuel. We are customer focused. So if our customer needs uh, biodiesel, diesel, DEF, hydrogen, electric vehicle charging, whatever it is, we make sure to serve our customers. About five years ago loves purchased Trillium. And Trillium was in the CNG business and has been in CNG business for about 25 years. Um, Tr- Trillium's target market is the transit customer. I would say about 60 to 70 percent of our customer base is transit customers. But for, in general, we serve fleets. And those are usually return to base fleets, but we do also serve over the road um, class seven and eight uh, types of fleets as well. Um, I would say about three years ago, we noticed that our customers started asking questions about zero emission. Um, So electric vehicle charging and hydrogen fueling. So that made us kind of wonder and and move and open up our business into the zero emission business. And that's where I come in. I manage strategic business development for both Trillium and Loves. For us, that includes electric vehicle charging, hydrogen fueling, management of our solar business, as well as all of the futuristic stuff, right? So things like autonomous trucking, we see that coming over the horizon. We want to make sure that we understand those markets. So if and when they do come, we're able to be be economical and lucrative in those businesses. I wasn't really aware of how heavily your business was centered around transit. And I, I can recognize that if you're dealing with those entities, their focus from a kind of a government perspective on zero emissions, a little maybe higher profile, higher priority than for your over the road uh, commercial customers, right? Yeah. And, and that's really the good thing about having a customer base that's so, um, so diverse So the transit, you're absolutely right. The transit market, especially when you're thinking about places like California, where you have the innovative clean transit rule that's um, uh, saying that transits have to be zero emission by a certain amount of time. Transits are moving toward uh, zero emission much quicker than the class seven and eight market. You're starting to see those mandates come out for, for trucking fleets and things like that. But the good thing for our organization is that we get to have that experience um, now. So we are building hydrogen fueling stations, electric vehicle charging stations for ourselves and our customers. So we've built two hydrogen fueling stations, one for the Orange County Transportation Authority. The second one for it was is for Champaign-Urbana Mass Transit District. We're supposed to be starting commissioning. We're in commissioning now, actually. That station should be up and running within the next 30 to 60 days. Um, so, So those experiences that Trillium's getting um, with our transit customers is going to help us um, for for our own, our own network, right? Our own public network, right. our loves network. If and when it, it's time to start putting in hydrogen fueling stations at our loves network, um, we're prepared for that because we have those experiences. And not only are we so, designing and building it, we're also operating and maintaining it. So we're getting a really good idea of what OPEX is for, for these sorts of stations. So let's chat a little bit about hydrogen. So you have the two stations you've one operating, one commissioned. Yep. How are you sourcing the hydrogen? Because I know you can get it straight from a, a pipeline. You can convert natural gas. What's your commercially viable opportunity to bring hydrogen to the market? So those. So we've been really fortunate. <clears throat> two stations that we've built are two different sorts of stations. So the first station for OCTA, the Orange County uh, Transportation Authority, is a liquid hydrogen station. We actually partnered up with Air Products on that station, so it is an Air Products molecule that's that's being used there. 
Um, so that's a, that's your typical liquid hydrogen station, right? A tank with some pumps and and some high pressure storage vessels and vaporizers and things like that. Um, on the Champagne Urbana station, um, that is a little different. For them, they're producing hydrogen on site. We're utilizing a nail electrolyzer, a one megawatt electrolyzer at their site. Um, so that's the way that they're producing hydrogen. Um, so, so two different ways. As, as far as when it comes to things that we're, we're thinking about now, when I put my loves hat on, my Trillium public network hat on, um, how do we think stations are going to be at our state, at our, at our truck stops and at our travel centers? We're... What we're saying now is it depends. It depends on the electrical tariff. It depends on how much land we have next to our truck stop. It depends if we have ways to get liquid or gaseous hydrogen to our stations. It really it depends on can we get a natural gas pipeline to our, our truck stop. We're not saying all of the hydrogen stations at every loves is going to look exactly like this. We're, we're open to whatever makes the most economic sense in specific regions. So... As we think about the kind of future of transportation, you know, the administration says we want to go ZEV, we want to have infrastructure for charging. Everybody usually hears that and thinks, my car, my passenger vehicle. It is a completely different environment to decarbonize light duty vehicles than it is to decarbonize the medium heavy duty market. Yeah. Um, Fuels Institute just recently commissioned a white paper, and we're looking at segmenting the class three to class eight market not just by class, but by vehicle type, by use case, by energy demands. So when you're looking at the variety of options you guys have available, obviously hydrogen, electric vehicle charging, natural gas, where do you see it kind of playing out? And are you targeting certain use cases and certain customer types with each technology? Or is it more trial and, <clears throat> trial and error? Excuse me. Um, I hate to say, so my background is engineering. And the answer that engineers always say is, it depends. <laughs> and, <Right. laughs> and quite honestly, it depends. So so I, I manage both our electric vehicle charging um, business and our hydrogen business. And we're taking those businesses in two kind of different ways. So electric vehicle charging. There is a there are a lot of grants um, throughout the country to put in light duty, to put in chargers, period. Um, You can work with the utility, you can get a federal grant, you can get a state grant, you can get all this, you can get a grant from the air quality management districts. There's all this money that's out there. And it's, and and I don't want to trivialize it, but it's easier to put in one or two chargers at a truck stop than it is to put in a hydrogen fueling station at a truck stop. That costs millions of dollars in order to put in that sort of infrastructure. So on the AV in the EV space, um, we haven't really we've tried dabbling in um, providing electric vehicle chargers to our transit customers, um, but what we found is that um, we can put in 150 kilowatt chargers, three of them at a truck stop for twenty thousand dollars. That's a station that should have cost us almost four hundred thousand dollars because right. of all the money that's out there, and we're learning a lot. Not only are we learning how to build it, we're learning how to operate it. We're learning about tariffs. We're learning how to price this stuff. We're learning how these things work. We're learning how to really operate a business in the light duty space. So whenever we have to move it to the heavy duty space, we can do so quickly because we've already learned it. In that case, it's kind of trial and error. In the hydrogen space, we're, we're taking a different approach. It's still sort of trial and error, but it's not at our properties. It's at our transit customer properties, properties, right? So behind the fence, third party type mm-hmm. stations. Um, so we don't have complete control. We're, re- we're responding to RFPs just like every other company is responding. And we kind of have to do what they say. Um, we, we don't have ownership. So it's still trial and error, but it's in a different way. So I would say, uh, I guess the short answer is right now we're looking for economic ways to learn. Um, ways that don't spend so much capital to where we don't see a return. We're not a trial and error type company. We're not really a pilot project type of company. We, When we make an investment, we like to see a certain type of return. But we do recognize that 
the transportation market is changing. And in order for us to remain relevant, we have to be we have to be able to move where the market's moving. Now, the question is, do we want to be on the, the bleeding edge or the cutting edge? So it's, it's, it's really balancing out those things for us. You raise a great point, because when you think about the policy announcements and all of these aspirational goals of going to an electric vehicle market and building out infrastructure and, you know, the word just, just do it, just build yeah. it. There's this lack of awareness that you can't make money on EV chargers right now. There's just, we've done, we've put together the spreadsheets. We've done the analyses. We've done all the calculations. It's, it just does not make economic sense. No. We need to build it if we're going to have electric vehicles. When we think about scaling up for the heavy duty space, now your transit customers are going to electrify. They're going to have their depots. They're going to be charging back at, at base. I don't see them very often coming to your, to the Love's Travel Center to recharge a bus, a city bus. But if we start electrifying the commercial vehicles <clears throat> that frequent loves, we're not talking about 150 kilowatt charger. Yep. We're talking about megawatt chargers yes. and the infrastructure to support that and the economics behind that. Have you modeled what the relationship yeah. between a megawatt system and a 150 kilowatt system, w- clearly scale magnitude, but yes. in terms of the economics, are they relatable or are they completely different animals? That's a good question. <laughs> I have a lot of questions. I don't have any answers, but I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Let me start there. That's an amazing question. That's a question that we've been asking ourselves right now, and, and you hit the nail on the head. I don't want to be the one to say it, but since you said it, I'll repeat it. It doesn't make very much economic sense to put in these chargers. We're not making very much money off of them. Um, we suspect that we will over a certain time, and we hope that whenever the adoption of EV uh, charger or EV vehicles um, happens in in a pretty big way, we hope that we're not stuck with an iPod Nano while everyone else is on the iPhone 24. Um, or I had I had what was the other one that when the iPod came out, there was another uh, MP3 player that I bought because I don't like Apple products, and like two years later, I couldn't get any attachments to it. I'm like, what the- Dead stick. You don't want you don't want to invest a couple hundred thousand dollars and have a dead stick sitting there, right? Exactly, exactly. So it's really keeping that in mind. Um, to your question specifically, which is which is a loaded one, um, what does charging look like in a heavy duty atmosphere? Um, it's not 150 kilowatts. It's up to 500 kilowatts, and I've even heard people say um, megawatt chargers. Right. Um, and we're talking about truck stops that don't really use that much power today. Um, and we're also talking about truck stops that aren't in downtown Houston, Texas, downtown Chicago. It's middle of nowhere, Ohio, right? So it's places where it's hard to get a lot of power out to, and it takes a significant amount of time to get a lot of power out there. So what are the things that we're doing today in order to make sure that we're prepared for the future? We started developing plans within our organization to understand what a truck stop would need if heavy duty charging would be needed at that truck stop. So whenever we are putting in new truck stops across the country, we're putting in, um, we're thinking about ways and we're putting in ways to make sure that we are able to move quickly whenever it is time to put in those chargers. Um, if that means conduits, if that means assessing where the transformer we need to be, if that means when we're talking to the utility company, instead of asking for just a 240 uh, volt transformer, at this point we ask for a 480 volt just to be prepared for the future. Um, maybe that means getting a 12 kV uh, type of transformer. Um, things like that. Um, understanding the hazardous area that has to do, if we have a CNG station there, where can we put these chargers? Would we want to put these chargers in the truck parking spots? Would we want to put them in lanes? Same thing with hydrogen dispensers. Would, would we want to put them in lanes? Would we need chillers next to that dispenser? Now we need more room for that for that chiller. So, so, so we have started thinking about how do we make sure that we're retrofitting the, the new truck stops that we're putting in today in certain regions of the country so that we're prepared to move quickly um, in the future? Really what it comes down to for us is, um, does it make economic sense today? Probably not, right? Um, but how do we set ourselves up so that we can move quickly whenever it does make economic sense? And that's one of the messages we're trying to impart to policymakers. Okay, you have a goal, half a million chargers, nice round number, great soundbite number, but we don't know what the number is. 
We also don't know if we're going to need half a million chargers by 2030. We don't know when we're going to need to charge. And so we can yeah. avoid the, the lost investment, stranded assets, tweak the policy to support what you're describing as future proofing. Start building the plans and the capabilities to mm-hmm. install the chargers when there is a need for those chargers in a certain market. And I think if we can be strategic about it, deploy the type of equipment we need, where we need it, when we need it, we can accelerate the ROI. We can support the market. We can support the transition to a lower emission vehicle system. All these things. <clears throat> the challenge comes into we have to get out of the headline grabbing pronouncements yeah. and get to the actual strategic plan making and I you know, I'm a former lobbyist. I have very little <laughs> hope that we're going to be able to get there in the political environment we're in. And I'm hoping that cooler heads will prevail and they'll sit down and build plans in conjunction with industry yeah. so that the market functions for the consumer. Because ultimately, if we're not putting that customer first, it's all going to fall apart. I completely agree with you. I, I, I think one thing, and you said it in one of your questions, a lot of times, or sometimes, I shouldn't say a lot of times, sometimes policymakers will make policy and say, okay, just do it. Just put in the chargers. Mm-hmm. Why don't you just put in these fueling stations? It's coming. Just, just it's so it easy. Just. <laughs> just like, well, that's millions of dollars of investment and there's nothing on the road today. So it's it's not a just do something. So, so what I wish would happen, and it's starting to happen a lot more, um, more recently with task force and things like this and conversations like these, quite honestly, it's understanding what the challenges are for private industry. Because it's, we're not saying that we don't want to put it in. We're not saying that we're a diesel company and we will always be a diesel company. We recognize that the future is going to be different. What we're calling it is, is a truck stop of the future where you have diesel, biodiesel, renewable diesel, CNG, um, EV charging, hydrogen fueling. You're going to have a truck stop that has all kinds of different fuels. We recognize that that's happening. We just want to do it in a way that makes economic sense and recognize the challenges that are going to come as we get there. If we put in 10 chargers, each one one megawatt. That's a 10 megawatt station. Can right. you imagine the power? You need your own generator. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. So I just, and I just wish that we would, that we would think through that and understand that there are challenges that come along with that and kind of come together as an industry and say, okay, utility company, how are you going to get that much power out there? Cause, cause I, I want it. If I need to put the chargers out there and my customers say they have electric <clears throat> trucks, I'll put them out there. But how are you going to make sure that you get that power to me? That That's really the conversation that should be happening. Collaboration across sectors is sure. critical if we're going to be successful in any of this. I want to back up. So you're, work, you're focused on hydrogen electrification now. We, we know they're going to have great application. They're going to fit a variety of use cases, not going to fit all. But I think you and I first crossed paths several years ago when natural gas was the hot topic in the, in the market. And that's how I first became familiar with Trillium. When we started the Fuels Institute, we, we were doing all this natural gas research. And then oil prices tanked and nobody, everybody stopped calling me about natural gas. But it's still a viable product for the heavy-duty on the truck. Where are you guys looking at natural gas? And is it still expanding? Is it still in demand? What are the prospects of that becoming a reliable and really valuable transportation fuel? Yeah. For us, we see, so there's a term that we've started using in, internally. It's called, we call it the Darwinism of energy. We, <laughs> see, yeah, we really see energy as, oh, there are go, there's going to be different energies at different points, right? So there's going to be different fuels that are used at different points. There's going to be a time where biodiesel is used in heavy demand and it's going to fade out, right? We see even diesel. It may not be in, in any of our lifetimes, but it's going to phase out. Right now, we're in an era where compressed natural gas is a technology that works here and now. It's economical here and now if you use it in the right way, right? So um, incorporating renewable natural gas, getting environmental attributes, whether it's a RIN or LCFS, and understanding the, the, uh, the revenue that you can get from those things. So for us... We see CNG as the transition fuel to get to these zero emission fuels. Right now, electric vehicle charging, hydrogen fueling is not economic, full stop. CNG is. And CNG is the technology that works today, that's economic today, where you can get your payback today. So for us, it's it's really a transition fuel. 
Um, and, and there's opportunities for fleets to actually have a, um, an alternative fuel that makes money and that has a low carbon intensity. So if you're looking for an ESG type of solution, an environmental, environmentally friendly solution, for us, RNG is still the way to go. Yeah, you know, it's there's so many opportunities out there to reduce the carbon footprint of transportation. And the biggest concern I have is the headlines, the announcements, the policy statements are basically robbing the volume from all these other immediate options, natural gas, renewable diesel, biodiesel, all these things have the ability to reduce our carbon footprint now. But if we're not going to have them part of the equation, they're not going to get the opportunity to be a contributor to a lower carbon market because we're focused on that white horse down the road. And I've been telling people for for the last several months, if you believe that reducing carbon from the transportation space is necessary to save the planet, and you're waiting for the white night of electric yeah. vehicles ubiquitously across the world, we've already lost. Uh, we're going to have combustion engines on the market for decades. We're going to have electric vehicles on the market. We're going to have hydrogen vehicles. We're going to have them all. And we can reduce the carbon footprint of all of them if we keep our eyes open. I love what you guys are doing because you're exploring and you're leveraging all the opportunities that are before you. And I hope more and more companies do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And I I think it also happened. So I serve on the board of the California Hydrogen Business Council. and And I think that the hydrogen market also sometimes gets into, or, or I shouldn't say the hydrogen market, sometimes folks, whether it be policymakers or, or, or legislators or whatever, put hydrogen in kind of a bucket to where it needs to be green on day one. All right. of it needs to come through solar and wind and all of it has to happen today. Well, there's ways to make renewable hydrogen that isn't just through solar and and wind power, right? You can use renewable natural gas through an SMR, and now you have a low carbon intensity, a low carbon intense hydrogen. So instead of going for the green hydrogen on day one, let's get what we can get that makes economic sense and have a goal to get to that white horse in the end. Um, How do we make it work today? And sometimes what I've noticed is that hydrogen kind of gets that rap, but electric uh, vehicle charging doesn't really get that rap as much, right? right? So no one's saying all chargers need to have green power tomorrow. Everyone's saying, okay, let's go to the utility and get the power. And not all utility power is, is, is green. And then we'll clean the grid later. Exactly. So I just, I just, I think the hydrogen market should be seen similar to, to the electric vehicle market, right? Like, let's get what we can get now. Let's get the market started and we'll we'll get it green over a certain period of time. That'll be the goal. But how do we get it started today? I would love to say the challenge you just described, which is 90% is not good enough in some people's mind, is a new phenomena. But I've yeah. run into this dealing with Congress for 25 years. And it is so frustrating because we are letting the idealized perfect, yes. which may not be the right solution long term, but right now it's being idealized that way, be the enemy of progress. Yes. And man, we got to break, we got to break that cycle. Otherwise, we're going to continue having these conversations about why did it didn't work. Well, because you wouldn't let it work. You wouldn't let us figure out how to make it work. And yeah. um, the system needs to be fixed. And I think the collaboration across parties is is critical. I think what you guys are doing and demonstrating the feasibility of these solutions is actually critical as well. So, Kim, thank you so much for joining us and sharing what you guys are doing at Trillium. And mm-hmm. I'm going to keep watching what you guys are doing because it's exciting stuff. I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to talk about what we're doing. I, you know, Trillium is the best company to me, but I'm a little biased. <laughs> I'm always happy to talk about what we're doing, both on the Trillium side and the Love side. Um, We're happy to be a part of the market and be learning just like everyone else. Thanks. I think I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. And for those you got back at home, thanks for tuning into Carpool Chats, and we'll see you next time. See you. Bye.